वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर जयदीप सौरंगी जोगेश चंद्र चौधरी कॉलेज डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकटा वी आर गोइंग टू रिकॉर्ड मॉड्यूल वन एंग्लो सैक्शन एज एंड इंट्रोडक्शन द मॉड्यूल इज प्रिपेयर बाय प्रोफेसर देवोमित्रा कौर वुमेन्स कॉलेज कोलकाता इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी ए फ्यू थिंग्स नंबर वन a brief outline of the political history of early england and the celtic civilizations the coming of anglo saxons and the subsequent changes in the politics economics and the social institutions the advent of christianity and its effect of the anglo saxon society and how the english identity and nation is made it is a common press practice that we often confuse history with past but when we trace back to the history of anglo saxon period we look back to their settlement their where are they come from and how are they settled in britain we are also looking into the political concept and the sociological resolutions that mattered during the settlement of the angles saxons and jutes in different parts of britain in this module we are going to conceptualize how things happened over a period of time and we trace back to the legacy of the settlement and socio political affairs that mattered into the making of them comfortable in an unfamiliar land it is a common place practice as we always confuse history with the past but the history always does or deals with history past that has been contested by the critics over a period of time it is shaped by the history itself and history is a powerful tool to look back and by the people and the land and language and things mattered most in the present section our attempt would be look at the beginnings of anglo saxon period and related to the growth of the indigenous literature we shall not merely be looking at such some important dates of history we will also record how and estimate the culture and the philosophy of the time there are a few impediments to the endeavor first at such an early state it is difficult to distinguish between history and myth secondly many old texts are lost and missing the first problem stems from the fact that the need for recording events of historical importance was failed much later the early and main were contained with composing songs and lays about their heroes and battles such songs were sung by the wandering minstrels or by some people such compositions colored the historical truth the imagination of the minds of people moreover when the songs were transmitted from generation to generation through the oral medium over changes were made and making it more suitable to the contemporary age this is true but not only the fact that remains to the core of things the scholars have pointed out that the christian interpolations in pagan literature because early writers were all men from religious background remember the use of the term men is not for the instance as generic significance here here for educate because the education of women was almost a dream in those days let us start with problems of old english the lack of data or recorded data is a major concern for the critics over generations there's a lack of recorded data since the earlier literature was completely oral when something is oral literature it has to be transmitted orally therefore there is no written document or written proof of the literature so when we analyze an old english data or old english text socially politically contextualization and after all sort of settlement of the angles sections jute in britain we largely trust or we largely fall back on the recorded data orally transmitted when something is transmitted orally something is lost so the biggest challenge 
that the critics face this age is the orality that has been handed down from generations of the old English texts through the medium. Next, the texts were later documented by Christian Clark, uh, Clarks who added and amended the texts according to their ideological positions. This is another central issue because when the Christianity came into England, many texts took the root uh, to the took uh, a different form with the infusion of Christian elements. So, the Christian missionaries or Christian people they infuse data on the basis of their ideological positions. So, what I found or what we actually found that the uh, texts were amended according to the subject, according to the promotion of Christianity. So, the paganism or heathenism was uh, in under heavy threat during that time. Next point would be many manuscripts were lost due to war or fire. So, in the old English period the texts were there, most of the texts were oral, but after war or after fire lot of documents were destroyed, which were also threat to our knowledge system or database system. Our next point of concern will be the manuscripts were usually kept in abbeys or in the library of rich men, thus there were only few copies of them. So, common people had no access to the manuscripts and the manuscripts were the property of the abbeys or the rich people because they sponsored it religiously or they sponsored it financially. So, by me by this we mean to say that the data had a brick crisis to continue or survive in the ages to come. Celts as we are familiar with as the real dwellers of England like the aborigines in Australia or Maoris in New Zealand. Here the Celts is diffused over Europe and can be divided into three groups Gaelis, Britannic and Gaelic. Gaulis was spoken in France and northern Italy in time of Roman Republic and was speared abroad by the Celtic militancy or military expeditions. And the Cornis was also an important text of the 15th century. So, the Celts took part importantly when the others settled in England because they already brought into their own legacy in sociological perspective as well as linguistic perspective. Now, let us move on to political history of the age. Prior to the arrival of Anglo Saxons, England was inhabited by the Celts. The Celts were, were colonized by the Romans and when we talk about the Celts, they were the real inhabitants of Britain and they had a different language and they had a different culture their political values were different, but when the Anglo Saxons and Jutes arrived in England, they had a complete different route altogether. The Romans also colonized the Celts and the Romans could not occupy the northern part of the island or the modern day Scotland, which was occupied by the Sidmonian and the Pictish tribes which was actually if we look into the sociological mapping or geo sociological movement of the people and the Romans were uh, occupied the entire Britain except the northern part of England. Around 142 CE the wall of Antonius and in 180 CE the wall of Hadrian was constructed to demarcate the northern boundary of Roman occupation in the island the southern part of the inter island was under their rule for next 350 years. So, actually when we look into the political mapping of between 140 CE to 
180C, there is a lot of political cross currents that affected the settlement or in England. The Romans made many significant legal and social changes and that was the implication of the Romans over the Anglo sections and Jews. The island uh, prospered under their rule of law because the Romans had a different legal system altogether. The problem began with the Roman army was called back to defend the empire from the Hun attacks. So, that was another important political affair that affected Anglo-Saxon life. Defenseless, the Britons went to seek help from the other Germanic tribes settled in their continental homes at the point of times. And we cannot deny our source book, which is uh, by bed, bed uh, actually recorded what had happened and what he had seen in front of his naked eyes. Bed recorded the names of two important warriors and their men from Jutland, who in 449 CE came to fight for the Britons and Hangit and Horsa. I think pronunciations are different because the pronunciations are old English and we actually Bede was the first person to record the, uh, uh, the history of England uh, uh, from the point of view of the settlement and the resistance from the home tribes. However, within a short period of time the foreign tribes to take advantage of the political turmoil. They started to loot and plunder the country and then finally settled down and established their rule. That is the rule or regulation for the invasion of any country. When one country invades over another country, the rules and regulations are imposed. Chiefly, three tribes claim and one uh, from uh, the Germanic land of Scandinavia, one is uh, Angles, the second is Saxons and the third is Jutes. Angles come from Germany and Saxons come from the Elbe river in Germany and Jutes come from Jutland. Hence, the period is known as the Anglo-Saxon age because Angles and Saxons became the most dominant tribes who actually settled and plundered Britain or invaded Britain among the tribes from Scandinavia. The tribes settled down seven kingdoms known as the Heptarchy and they always fought among themselves for political supremacy. Now, we switch on to one of the biggest contributors who significantly contributed to Anglo-Saxon literature, King Alfred. The most well-known king of Anglo-Saxon age who brought all the tribes together is King Alfred. The most historical contribution of King Alfred is the unification of all tribes under one umbrella. He fought against the Danish invasion that began around 787 CE. In 878 CE, he defeated the Danish chief Guthrun at Edinburgh and forced him to embrace Christianity and accept Alfred as the overlord of Wessex, Sussex, Kent, part of Essex and part of Marcia, while Alfred had to relinquish some of the parts of land to the Danes known as Danila or Danilaw. Alfred was also a great patron of learning and significantly contributed to the growth of literature and English language as the first organizer of English language during the old English period. Therefore, he has been called as the father of Anglo-Saxon prose. King Alfred is also known for his important contribution for translations from Latin texts into English, but we shall discuss at length when we shall be following his contribution to prose writings or Anglo-Saxon prose in a separate item or module. King Alfred's successors were not always successful in their reign. So, partly 
with Alfred gone the glory of the Anglo-Saxon uh, age and the patronship of literature. Fight, finally, not a Danish king was accepted by the English people as the ruler in 1016. However, the rule of the Danes was proved to be quite short in 1066 AD they were defeated by the Normans and we are all familiar with the Battle of Hastings in 1066 ushering the Middle English period. Let us now talk about polity and the economy of the Saxons. In the Anglo-Saxon England at first the role of the king or chief was much limited in political matters. He had to depend on the faithfulness of people. That means, the democratic strength was being celebrated during the Anglo-Saxon period. The smallest unit of governance was known as the moot. So, as in modern day, we think of the village, then the, then the city, then the, then the mega city or metro city. In the then time, the smallest unit of governance was moot and which was been regulated by the kingship. The moot was the assembly of free men who chose their own leader. So, the leader was selected and selected by people of their choice. At the kingdom's grieve in size, the moots were further developed into shrine moots and hundred moots and finally, the wheaten. So, in from the smallest unit to the larger units were formed as things shaped into a democratic format. The Witten was assembly of wise men with house and aldmen and themmen, that is uh, the later the bishops and archbishops. As the power of king consolidated, the business also prospered, because when the seat was confirmed, actually the business of the country grew stronger. And the free status of men was determined by the man money that is been in Anglo Saxon word called wriggled W E R G E L D. Wriggled is an Anglo Saxon word that stands for man money dichotomy that persisted during the Anglo Saxon age. As the economy prospered upward, social mobilization became easier because we know from the lower stratum to the upper stratum people started moving and there is a growth of democracy, growth of uh, man in that way. Now, let us talk about the effect of the heroic values. The great uh, migration turned the British society to a great melting pot. By melting pot, here you must understand we are all people people from different background, they come, assemble and they do their business. <coughs> Importance of a man dependent on the abilities and not on his racial identity, which I think is a very important happen, uh, event that took place, that man dependent on abilities, not on his racial identity. So, people coming from different parts of Scandinavia settling down in England they were never been treated as uh, uh, that uh, people coming from different uh, ba racial background and they were uh, under one unified umbrella. The close mingling of many races and the advent of Christianity helped to create a concept of an English nation. One serious growth that took place that uh, the uh, different races settled down in England and Christianity came to England. So, another thing that became part of this overall growth of a nation or identity of English nation. The basis of the his, uh, heroic values was loyalty to the Thanes, to their Lord. And uh, during that time, we really witness that people were devoted to their Lords. So, lords were respected in all fields, legal system and bureaucratic life in everyday life as well. 
and uh, that gives the gifts of the Lord as an acknowledgement of the service given by his followers. So, when someone is doing service to his country, he is actually paying back to the Lord as, as in a matter of acknowledgement of the service given by his followers. So, it is the country is in the making. So, the first time we come to notice the identity of a English nation is almost is taking shape of. Now, let us talk about or uh, let us learn the effects of Christianity. Christianity came to the came to the island in two phases, first with the early Romans and the later in 597 CE. If we go by the maps we are going to show, you can easily understand how Christianity was the important factor for the Romans and it entered with the Romans and later in 597 CE through a mission sent by Pope Gregory the Great actually and uh, uh, it started with Kent province and that was the advent of Christianity in England and later on within 100 years of time almost every king in England became Christian. In the second phase Christian missionaries, um, missionaries headed by Augustine landed at Ethelbert in Kent. The king of Kent was the first king to embrace the religion. So, that was an historical position uh, for the growth and prospect of Christianity in England and with Ethelbert and many kings followed immediately and they embraced Christianity and Christianity became the prominent and dominant religion of England within a short while. The superiority of Roman church was established in the scene of Whitby, because this is another significant event with the establishment of Canterbury church in England. The Roman church established its judiciary and legal power and authority over the British in during that time. The task of unifying the church was done by Theodore of Tharsis of Greek monk in 669. If we look into the time of history, we can easily find that the churches were almost scattered and there was no unifying factor and there was an attempt to unite the churches. So, that there is no, no sense of uh, in a falling uh, things falling apart regulars syndoms were held and their people first came together not a members of different races of tribes, but as Christians as common identity. This gave rise to the feeling of nationalism and the, for the first time in history of England we come and term it as a nationalism, because if we look into the perspectives of the entire country by now we have a common identity. The, even though we the we have people from different parts uh, of Scandinavia settled down, but settled down with a common mission to identify themselves with a common national identity. Christianity also changed the lifestyle and philosophy of the people. People in England before Christianity was heathen or pagan, they used to believe nature and nature as a god. When due to the advent of Christianity things changed, the ways of life changed, the ways of living changed, the commandments what to do, what not to do became very prominent under the Christian parlance. It brought the message of peace and war torn race. Previously England saw wars of different kinds, wars among each other, but the message of hope was established through the promotion of the Bible and largely by Christianity. However, the process of Christianization was not an easy one. Christian philosophy is marked and marked with difference from the pagan philosophy. Thus, the entire world view had been altered. Christianity succeeded because the royal patronage it enjoyed. That means, the Christianity was sponsored and promoted by the royal families. Therefore, it had an easy access to British common people. The church and king always worked together towards the consolidation of power 
and the power of a kingdom actually uh, uh, was conceptualized by the power of the king and the power of the church. The king was no longer elected through popular will. He was selected by divine power. There was another kind of change that took place. King was no longer being elected by common people, a will of people. Now it has been chosen or selected by the divine power. He was God's appointee on earth. <coughs> so a king is now being considered as the deputy of the Christ, a deputy of the God sent down on earth. Christian influence on literature can hardly be undermined. Let us talk about how Christianity affected literature uh, in, in, a, in a large scale. Since Christianity is a religion of the book, it became important to educate people. As we all know, the contribution of the Bible. As Christianity prom was promoted through textual premises, immediately it conquered the literary world. So it infused Christian elements, and the idea of hope, the idea of peace, and the Christian um, concepts into the writings of literature. Let it be la poetry or elegiac poetry or prose or prose related to Christian life or life of the saints. Literature graduates from oral to written state, a historical event took place. We are no longer to trust our memory now because we have a written record of things. For the first time, there is a switch over from orality to written form of literature. A large number of Latin texts were translated and they understood the value of translation of Latin texts into English and King Alfred, we have already mentioned his name, took an important part in translation of Latin texts into English and the nature of hero also changes in literature. Previously, uh, he, the de depiction was hero was different. Now, the hero has been colored under the Christian light. So, there's hold together as a whole, there is a sea change with the advent of Christianity, namely it in literature or in social life or political life of England. So, friends, uh, you now by the time you have understood a brief history of uh, the anglo saxon age as module 1, let us sum it up in this manner. The early history of England shows how English identity has been formed in different cultural identities and ethnic origins. So, it is a homogenizing process out of different uh, religious, linguistic or cultural roots. The migration of the age is an important factor. The tribes migrated and settled in different parts of Britain. Their appropriation into British literary tradition, social tradition and political tradition are also important for the perspective of the development or if we call the birth of nationalism in Britain. At the same time, we have looked into the languages of different tribes and their customization with the Celts. The gradual transformation of society from pagan to Christian is historical, effective, influential and signal for the years to come. The writing which was predominantly pagan and heathen had a changed Christian look after the advent of Christianity, which served as a big contributor to the years to come. So, literature of the age took a new shape with the advent of Christianity and with coming in contact with Celtic literary tradition. So, on the whole, the Anglo-Saxon age 
starting with 420 AD to 1066 AD conceptualizes a political, sociological, literary and linguistic resourcefulness where we fall back to conceptualize the advent of Christianity, the marking of society from pagan to Christian and a literature which has been the source or inspiration for generation to come. No module or no class should be complete without referring books. I think you have enjoyed module 1. Now you can look into the following, look into these books. Number 1, John Blair, The Anglo-Saxon Age, a very short introduction which has been published by Oxford University Press and easily available and accessible in libraries. Number 2, Michael Swanton, English Literature Before Chaucer. It is a Longman publication in 1987. Patrick Wormald, Anglo-Saxon Society and its Literature, the Cambridge Companion to Old English Literature by Cambridge University Press. I think these three books which help you a lot. Thank you so much.